What kind of a world would you rather live in? A world of overcrowded classrooms where individual attention is a myth? And if you have special needs, you're being bullied, you want individual attention, good luck raising your hand and being called on by the teacher and having enough time for yourself and your own needs. Or a world where everything is customized to you, personalized for you, and at a moment's notice, you can have the exact most relevant, most customized educational curriculum delivered at your fingertips. Maybe you're artistic, maybe you're autistic, maybe you're metaphorical, maybe you're analytical. Maybe you have a certain career track that's different than everybody else around you, and because of that, why should you be penalized and learn at the same place? In Star Trek, Spock had this awesome little holodeck, and that was his school. I think that's where we're headed in planet Earth. To solve the systemic problems of education, we created No Child Left Behind. It was designed to hold every student, teacher, and school at a high standard, and the same standard. It wasn't really that functional, and it was kind of a sign of the times. But unfortunately, No Child Left Behind, the thing that affected 50 million kids as they were in K through 12 every single year, ended up as a failure. It was cited as having too many variables to be really attainable, because when you try to hold everybody to the same standard, it doesn't really work. Instead of learning the things that we really need to learn to be prepared for the world, problem solving, creative thinking, job readiness, students were studying to achieve higher test scores for tests that really didn't matter as much as we thought they would, and really ended up being abandoned when no child left behind was finally repealed, yet 14 years after it was around. But during that time, hundreds of millions of kids in the school system were experiencing subpar education and lost a significant amount of time. Now, we look at K-12 education, and we wonder, does it really matter? Is it the thing that makes the most sense for us? I mean, after all, college is what most of us choose, what most of us choose to have reflect who we are out in the world. Yet, as college tuitions rise, our income is not rising with it. And you look at this gap, and you wonder, is this sustainable? We wonder, is this investment paying off? And is this kind of a big micro trend, reflecting a bigger macro reality? Actually, it kind of is, but not in the way we think. Our GDP is rising, but our individual incomes are not. And we're wondering, well, if we're slightly more prosperous as a nation, who's kind of getting shafted? And what resources do we have to really deal with that problem? Thinking about this, I started studying national debt. And I started looking at how quickly it's growing. And this hockey stick growth curve, the thing that we love to see in startups out here all the time in the valley, is actually going down way faster than we can sustainably deal with it. And instead of revenues rising, revenues are kind of rising a little bit, but we're left with fewer and fewer resources every year to devote to the things that actually matter. So in this system, does anybody win? And if so, who? Well, what we're used to seeing is families that have money and have resources for education usually end up doing pretty okay. If your family can afford good tutors, good books, good programs, you score higher in the CT, you do better in college, and you make more income in the long run. So really, what we're seeing is the 1% is staying as the 1%. Now, this might be okay for them, but while I'm not an economist and I look at something like this, I wonder if this society can actually sustain itself and support itself. And when I think about that, I wonder who of us actually loses. For the majority of us that don't have those types of advantages, what kind of a future are we looking like? I mean, yeah, college is more expensive, yeah, we're making less money, that leads to rise in debt. And with 2015 as the most indebted class ever, we're seeing PhDs moving with their parents. And instead of having this grand vision where after school we build a great career, we're taking our living standards down, we're lowering our job prospects, and we're delaying having a family and having kids, all because we are having to pay more and more for the thing that's supposed to give us all the preparedness we need for the rest of our life. And the rock solid foundation that education used to be for every person in America is now becoming tenuous. And we wonder, can we choose the career path we're passionate about? Or do we have to choose something that is more stable, more solid, but less fun? And really, might be tenuous and crumbling. In fact, when we think about the ivory tower of college, and when we send it our prayers and our hopes and our dreams, one of the things that could actually be happening is that power is starting to crumble. It's starting to become destroyed. So we think about all the problems that we have, the fact that we're not really able to make this work, and we wonder, should we just scrap it? Should we start with a completely blank state? Well, there's other reasons why we need to learn as quickly as possible. AI is fantastic. It's growing really quickly. 
Yet, a lot of people say half of US jobs could disappear in the coming years because of artificial intelligence. Now, while art unemployment is not a new thing, it's becoming a bigger thing, faster than you might be able to deal with it. Foxconn is one of the biggest manufacturers of technology under Apple, and they just announced they're buying a million robots to replace workers in their factories. Now, that's a lot of jobs lost in a very short period of time, but it doesn't compare to what's happening with driverless cars. Yeah, it's great. Nobody wants to sit behind the wheel and struggle for hours during a commute and have all their time wasted while they could be more productive, and we're celebrating these, these advances, these technologies. But we're also seeing that they could also erase 10 million jobs. Whether you build cars, repair them, or work in the auto insurance industry, your career is at risk. And this isn't 10 million over a long period of time. This is 10 million within 10 years. Do we have the educational system for primary school, for secondary school, for continuing education to help all these people be retrained as quickly as possible? I'm not sure. What I do know is that in our society, everything that we can't automate, we will automate except for education, which is kind of odd. We're still relying on human teachers, we're still relying on brick and mortar buildings, and they serve some people, but not everybody. And so for the rest of the world, what happens? So they just, the 99%, they just be unemployed, society crumbles? I don't know, but I do know that there is some good news. And technological unemployment is actually profitable. And doing some funky math, I figured out that there's a statistical value for human life, and the powers that be have agreed that this is pretty much $9.4 million. So when we have to make a tough call with an insurance payout if somebody dies, making our buildings or roads or vehicles safer, this is the amount of money that we've settled on when we have to make that tough call. So at one life is 9.4 million, and all the auto deaths annually, we look at a massive number that's over half of our GDP. It's pretty huge. And while about 154 million people are employed in this country, contributing about $116,000 per value per person, if we divide that into our GDP, Losing 10 million jobs is expensive, but not nearly as the savings we get from not having so many people die here from the human error that causes vehicle fatalities. Now, this is a game that isn't going to be realized immediately. There's probably going to be a crisis. People are probably going to be freaking out. This is a tough decision that we may not even have the choice to make. It might just be happening. But if we realize the good of this scenario, we might start thinking that technological unemployment, that getting rid of the old and embracing the new faster than before, is actually worthwhile embracing these tough decisions might make a lot of sense. John Henry is an infamous railroad worker in American folklore, and every single day and every single night, he would pound the railroad ties, building them as fast as he could. When steam-powered machines came out, he actually fought against them to see who could build a railroad faster. And in the end, John Henry died, the machine was repaired, the machine was healed, and you don't see very many railroad workers working the type of job he did anymore. Now, we don't know that that, just like we don't lament the loss of weavers that the cotton room has spread, and we don't lament the fact that most travel agents have gone away, and we can instead use Expedia. We've embraced the spread of technology as jobs went away, and this has helped us achieve a lot of things. Global poverty is dropping extremely fast. This used to be one of the most significant issues in the world, and now we're able to tackle it at scale. We're able to tackle it because of things like Moore's Law that allows technology to become more and more complex as the number of transistors in any of our devices increases exponentially over time. We see it in the things that we use every day, and we see it in the things that we're building in the not-too-distant future. In fact, Peter Diamandis, who founded the Global Learning X Prize, wrote a book called The Buttons, talking about how the future is actually brighter than we think, how with exponential technologies and exponential resource availability, we can solve a lot of these problems, and our future is actually quite bright. In 2 billion under 20, written by my friends Jared and Stacy, we look at all the people in the world who are not yet finished with their education, who might even be skipping part of it. And we look at the difference they could make. With all the good years they have in front of them, with all the potential, with all their ideas, there's a lot that we could do, and there's a lot that we could fix, despite how broken the system is. Now, the Global Learning X Prize is kind of odd. It's designed to make technology free. It's giving away $10 million to anybody who can create software that can teach kids reading, writing, and basic math. Now, if you live in a crappy school district, or have a crappy teacher, or possibly none at all. This is a godsend. But if you do have that stuff, this technology could very well likely replace teachers and replace those schools. But I think it's needed because how else can we deliver the types of basic foundational education in a high quality standard yet customized way to people all over the globe? And for the rest of us who are no longer in school, there's a lot of other resources we can look to. We're finding out about plants like Angel Global and getting enough scientific evidence to realize 
It can slow cognitive decline. It can improve memory. We can actually find pills like the Nepozil or Depico that can help us learn as fast as kids. And for those of us worried about baby boomers or anybody who's a little bit older and becomes unemployed, well, we can think about the brain implants that doctors are working on that help us learn skills faster. Now, I'm kind of worried about things like this, and it opens the privacy versus security debate wide open, but there's always a dark side to technology, and the nice thing about this is it solves a problem that we may not be able to solve directly or any other way. In fact, thinking about AI, it might not be the source of global destruction and unemployment, all of us think. According to Ray Kurzweil, a researcher in AI and director of engineering at Google, we might actually be able to merge with it and have hybrid thinking, where if we need information, we can pull it right from the cloud. Instead of doing a Google search, we can just have what we need at our fingertips. Learning might be different, but human relevance won't be. Usually, if something's wrong or something's broken, you replace it. If the bones in your leg are completely shattered or it's destroyed or possibly not existent from birth, now we can do things like actually get new legs that work just as well, if not better, than what we had previously. But in order to do that, we have to think about what we want to sacrifice. Is there enough money? Is there enough time? Are there enough resources to go around? In one scenario of the future, where there actually are not, Matt Damon plays a factory worker named Max. And in Elysium, the 1% live in this beautiful satellite habitat with lush forests, beautiful golf courses, and clean water. While the rest of the world is overpopulated, dirty, and not all that nice of a place to be. In fact, a nurse, one of the few human jobs left, has to take her sick daughter and try to sneak into Elysium to get her adequate medical care. Yet, the powers that be can't help her. Instead of a fine or jail time in this version of society, you can actually get deported from the only place that you really want to be. How can we avoid that type of a world? If we're automating cars, do we automate cops? Do we automate social workers and psychologists, the people that we learn to and turn to for help? Do we become the proletariats that build our own grade as we build the robots that take our own jobs without really good, viable alternatives for the rest of us? These are tough decisions we're going to have to think about. And yeah, robots can detect sarcasm. It's kind of interesting. They can do things that we can do. What are we going to have to learn in order to overcome these problems? And realistically, what can we afford? We know our debt is massively high, so this is likely not a solution that's going to come from the public sector. We know that we only spend about 3% of our national budget on education. We have other priorities, and regardless of the ROI to society, the other priorities we've chosen to spend money on are continuously growing, taking more and more money away from other types of things. Triage is a concept that we've been used to. It's a concept we don't really like, but we do it when we have to. If you have two patients, and they're both sick, in fact, they're both near death, and you can only save one, who do you save? Do you save the younger one? Do you save the person who can contribute more to society? The person whose life is more likely able to be saved? And it's a tough call. And we don't like to make it. We don't like to choose one life or the other. But when we're forced, when we're in a moment of true crisis, we make that call. And I wonder, do we have to make that call now? Does it make sense to be proactive? What really matters in thinking about education? What really matters in thinking about the future of the world? Do we have a future of abundance or a future of scarcity? Are we forced to look at the things where we don't have money, we don't have opportunity, we don't have jobs? We look at things like maybe money doesn't matter, maybe at a certain point, if you make more money, it doesn't increase your baseline happiness, maybe we can all just be like Bhutan that measures and celebrates their gross domestic happiness and holds it in extremely high regard. Yeah, these are really important things but they shouldn't be default, and they shouldn't be replacement. So if the public sector doesn't help us, maybe the private sector can. EdTech is skyrocketing, and investment into it has been troubled over the last five years. Companies like Newton are building engines, like we saw with Spock in the beginning of the slide deck, that have a deliverable systems of adaptive learning. Platforms like Udemy, where I have some courses, along with Coursera and Udemy, and Udacity, have all types of educational content that you can get anywhere in the world at any time. If you don't have the best education in the world in your own neighborhood, in your own backyard, you can get it in the cloud. That's something we've never seen before, and that's something that has a lot of promise and a lot of potential. Now, we have war, we have famine, we have natural disaster, we have disease, but none of those have stopped the exponential trend of growing innovation over the last 200 years. We don't see any downspikes in this trend, in this curve. And while we might be entering some times of crisis, some times of strain, some times of stress, we know that we're going to continue forward as a human race, as a global village. 
And there's organizations like Startup Grind, which are actually helping us make this change at a wide scale, where 400,000 entrepreneurs around the world can get the resources, mentoring, and support they need to support themselves financially, to make new technology that can impact others, and to create something when previously they had nothing. And that hockey stick of, de of debt we saw actually does happen. And it might not happen extremely frequently, but it happens beyond revenues. It happens in the changes we see in how we live our lives. I don't really go to the store that much. I pretty much buy everything off of Amazon. And if we think about the companies that have exponential growth, we think about how quickly they scale. And we click, think about the types of people who enable them to scale. In this classic model of the diffusion of innovation, it's kind of interesting that about 2.5% of us are labeled as innovators. That's remarkably similar to the 3% budget we have for education as a country. I think and I propose that to make the types of changes as quickly as we need to, we need to shift this curve to the left. We need to increase the focus, the attention, the money, the resources, the time we put into education so that we can have some hockey sticks in there. Not just companies making money, but companies changing quickly enough to get us out of debt, to get us learning what we need to learn. And when people find their skills obsolete, to get them retrained as quickly as possible. In our current world, we have broken down classrooms where students aren't really motivated, aren't really supported. I propose we do something kind of radical, that instead of living in that world, we think of a new one that we can build. We think of one that's scalable, that's digital, that's customizable, and we think of what we could do with it. We think of our current system and how resource constrained it is, how bloated it is, it's not that agile, and we wonder, does it make sense to take the surgeon's knife? Does it make sense to take this old, bloated system and do what we have to do? Now, it is shocking, it is difficult, it is painful, but after we do that, we can look and pick up the pieces of the world we used to have. We can think about the fragments of education, the fragments of teachers, the fragments of learning, and realize that while we don't have the Goliath we've been funding, we have something new. And I ask you in building that system, what are you prepared to do? Education of the future might have some remnants of the old system. It might have a lot of that floated budget. It might have a few customizable parts that are agile for us. And it might have a few parts that we can personalize to ourselves. We realize that the new whole is greater than the sum of its parts. We realize that the future can be a lot brighter if we're willing to make difficult choices. So I take these ideas, I take these theories, and I offer them to you. And I ask you again, what type of world would you like to live in? Thank you.